Let's take a look at a photocell kit. This is designed for mounting outdoors and it will control external lighting or internal lighting. You could also mount it indoors in a, a well illuminated area from external illumination. Um, so you get the pack of hardware, you get the device itself. Now this whole kit, typically in the UK from a proper UK supplier, this one came from tool station, it could have come from Screwfix or one of the other suppliers. Uh, this typically costs about £10 for the kit. The bayonet cap on head, the replacement head, costs about five or so pounds to replace. So it's just, it's considered a consumable. If it fails in this case, you can actually just keep the existing socket in the wall and just plug the new one in. This is quite a ferocious picture at the moment. Let's tame it down just a little bit, just to, to make it more manageable. Unusually, it comes the cork gasket. A lot of them come with a sort of firm, sort of spongy rubber gasket. Although another set hand, this one has a sort of foam gasket, a closed cell foam gasket on the inside. And it comes with the uh, the socket itself. The socket itself, it's worth noting it has a large pin and two small pins just to aid orientation when you put it in. And you, you press it down into it and then you turn it clockwise to lock it into position. I will be opening this in a moment. Um... The wiring is what you'd expect. It's got phase coming in, live coming in, going to LI, live in, live out to the load, and then neutral, which loops through this photocell, but also goes to the load, because the photocell itself requires some power. This is a slight time delay. When you initially power it up, it will turn the lights on for about uh, 10 to 30 seconds before they cut back out again. It's just as it stabilises. That unfortunately means that if you have this in a time switch with the view to the time switch coming on, but the light is only coming on once the uh, once once it gets dark enough, then you're you're going to have that slight period that lights come on in advance, which is double the wear. So in a way, it's maybe not that great where you've got the two combined like that. The unit does not come with a gland. Where is a gland? Where is a gland? There's a 20 millimeter gland, which fits perfectly. So in the case of, well, it's a UK standard UK size 20 millimeter hole for that. But I notice that they don't seem to leave an awful lot of space once this is screwed in for the connections. It really is the bottom the, of the uh, wire insertion points are really close to the gland. That's a, a, it'd be nice if they just added an extra quarter to half inch there. Roughly 15 millimetres or so. It comes with uh, the couple of, uh, well, it comes with four screws. I think two are supposed to be the ones that actually screw it onto the wall with the roll plugs and two are supposed to be the ones for the self-tappers, but they've supplied three self-tappers, short self-tappers and one wall one in this instance. It also comes with a little plastic cap that if you're not immediately putting the uh, sensor in, or you take the sensor away for some reason, you can put that cap over and it kind of gives it some waterproof sealing. I will say that the fact if you do use a gland in the bottom of this and that seal does leak at all, although this does kind of cuff over it, it forms a sort of a lip seal. Any water get into that would otherwise get trapped. But I guess it's okay. So let's open this up and see what's inside. And a bit of a jump because this is the original photocell head out of that because I've just gone and mounted the other one on the wall because it was getting dark outside and I thought, let's start that before it gets too dark. But it did get too dark. I ended up the head torch, but that's okay, that's what they're for. So this is the original photocell off the bracket, which is now on the wall and wired into the lighting at the front of the house. And the reason for that, I want to test that photocell, but I also want to uh, install some festoon with LED lamps in it and do a long-term test on that. So I just thought, well, let's... Uh, Order the uh, photo sensor, but also get a spare head just to see if it's the same type. And it is, it's the same circuitry inside. I can see that through translucent top. But that's now up. Let's take this one apart because the spare is actually the one that I used just in case I broke this one. So it's got this foam ceiling ring and it looks to all intents and purposes, if, unless they've glued it, it looks as though it's just held in by wedges. It is held in by wedges. It's just clipped in. It is a mass-produced device. But this is one of these ones that it's going to take a bit of force to get that out. It's not too bad. What do we have? We have a capacitive dropper with a 
massive 680 nanofarad capacitor. Uh, what voltage is this really? Let me just take a close look at this. Uh, the really, it's probably mounted in the, it's probably marked, I think it's 12 volts. That's odd. Normally you use a 24 volt. We have the light sensor here, uh, pointing out the side effectively. Is this going to be a 555? I can already see it's a 555 timer. Any 555P? Right, tell you what, let's, is this going to, I don't think this is going to come out as is. I think we're going to have to actually desolder this. That's going to be messy. Um, but I'm going to do that, and then we'll reverse engineer this and see what the circuitry looks like. I'll be back in a moment. Well, I'm glad I bought two of them because this one's not going back together anytime soon, owing to the fact I had to physically drill out the brass contacts because the mass of those brass contacts was so big, and the way they've been soldered in from the top, but with huge pads in the bottom, meant that they presumably use an absolutely massive solder iron where they actually make it, just to actually get the heat into those uh, brass contacts. But uh, I had to drill them out, I had to chop it out. Here is the circuit board, the top of it, and here's the underside but flipped, if you want to take a quick snapshot now and have a go at reverse engineering it yourself. I've not drawn all the tracks, I've not traced over the top of them, but uh, you can see them in the image. Uh, well enough to actually do that. Okay, here is a guided tour. It's based on a 555 timer. There's a power supply based on a 680 nanofarad, which is quite high, uh, capacitor here. The components you can't really see too well. There's two diodes here. There's the Zener or Zener diode under here, but there's also a 1.2 mega ohm resistor discharge resistor across that capacitor. That's pre presumably so when you pull this out, if whoever's pulling it out puts it in their hand, they don't get a whack off it. Um, it has... Is there anything else worth covering this? I should go straight to the schematic. I think I should go straight to the schematic. It's based on a relay here. Metal ox I've wrist across the contacts. There's the light sensor. There's the adjustment pot. Let's go straight to the schematic. That's it. That's the best bet. I've divided this into two sections. I shall zoom down onto this so you can get a better view. The incoming supply, we've got live coming in, but it's switched to the live output, the switched output via a relay contact. And there is what appears to be the metal oxide varistor across that, this big green component. It's the only sort of sensible component for that. The neutral goes straight to a discrete bridge rectifier based on uh, one, two, three, four diodes. And on the outside of that, there's a uh, Zener diode, Zener diode, and a smoothing capacitor. I marked it PSU in this drawing, as opposed to delay in that one. This will all become clear in due course. So we've got the uh, switch contact through the relay, we've got the metal oxide varistor, we've got the dropper capacitor, which is a really generously sized, 680 nanofarad, 630 volt. It's got an absolutely staggeringly big 1.2 mega ohm discharge resistor underneath. They're really rating it for high voltage spikes and nasty electrical environments. It looks like it's it's a real proper street lighting one. Then there's a 470 ohm resistor after that. That's this resistor. It is being used to limit transients to effectively, well, our supply is 240 volt. It's going to limit any current spikes to around about half an amp, which is very good. There's going to be a bit of dissipation off this. That's just how it happens. The current I measured through this was 50 milliamps. The dissipation measured by the hoppy was about 2 watts, either on or off. It goes through the bridge direct far. We've got the power supply capacitor, which is 100 megafarad, 35 volt. We've got that Zener or Zener diode. I'm guessing around about 15 volts because offload, when the relay is off, it floats up to 15 volts. When the relay is on, it doesn't go that much lower, 14.4 volts. The relay is going to be 12 volt coil. The reason for that is because it, it's a standard 12 volt rail for the 555 as well, the chip that does this th threshold detecting. And that's why they've had to go up, they've had to upsize the capacitor here to supply the higher current, the 50 milliamps that that uh, relay coil is going to need. So we've got our supply, this is the power supply, we've got the supply rails going out, 15 volts and zero volts. Flip the page. Here is the circuitry. It's a very simple use of a 555. We have the little light sensor, which appears to be a photodiode, and they are reverse biased in normal operation. I believe I, do, I don't use uh, 
footed out as much. But it is effectively, it varies the current flowing through it, so you could look at it like a, an LDR light dependent resistor. And it's in series with a 2K resistor to limit just how low that can go in bright sunshine. We have a 39K resistor in series with the adjustable pot, which is rated 100K, so you can actually fine tune the intensity uh, level it turns on and off at. So in bright daylight, the voltage will be closer to the 15 volt rail and at, when it's dark, it will be closer to the zero volt rail. This is kind of important. The 555 has integrated resistive dividers in it. It divides with three resistors and creates two voltage thresholds. So we've got a 15 volt supply going in. The upper threshold will be 10 volt. The lower threshold will be 5 volt. Normally, this would be used with a capacitor discharging and charging. Uh, it would charge up via resistor to the positive rail, and then when the uh, 555 turned on, it would then discharge that capacitor via a built-in transistor with uh, an external current limiter resistor, and for that, you can make it basically turn itself on and off. But it's not doing that in this instance. It's purely being used as a voltage threshold. When the <clears throat> input voltage from here... During daylight, it goes up towards the 15 volt rail. When it reaches 10 volts, it turns the relay off. The output goes off. And likewise, when it gets dark and the voltage starts going down, it reaches 5 volts, it turns it on. To delay that, to provide the delay, we've got the delay capacitor here. All that does is that if this was missing, if that was connected straight to the input, it would just toggle instantly on and off. And there's a risk that if you had the light nearby, it would actually cause it to oscillate at very high speed. So they put a time delay in. This also allows for headlights and sweeping across the light sensor or cloudy days that the, you know, you get a cloud passes briefly in front of the sun. It delays that. So instead of just jumping up and down like that, it actually slowly undulates up and down like that. And that adds that delay. That's also the reason that when you turn it on, the relay will energize initially because initially this uh, capacitor starts at zero volts. It's fully discharged. And even in bright sunlight, it'll the time delay it takes will depend on the level of light, ambient light. This will pull, the light sensor will be lit. It will be low resistance. It will be pulling that up to the 15 volt rail. And that capacitor will slowly, dis slowly charge via these components here. And only when it's fully chargeable, the uh, lights turn off. So that's why there's that slightly annoying thing that when you turn it on, the uh, load will come on briefly and then it will turn off. It's just the way it works. This little 10 nanofarad capacitor here is part of the voltage divider. It's just for stability. It's got comparators. It toggles when it reaches 10 volts. It switches to one state. When it reaches 5 volts, it turns on. So 10 volts turns off, 5 volts it turns on, and the output is capable of driving quite a bit of current. So it does it via this diode. I'm not quite sure about that diode, but it does it via the diode to switch the relay on. Uh, so this is relay coil. There is a more traditional diode across the relay, which in the event of uh, when the relay turns off in the event of the field collapsing and producing a reverse voltage spike to protect the transistors in the 555, this diode basically just provides a shunt current path so that current can flow through it and uh, it just clamps that. And that is it. It's a very simple two-step voltage threshold detector with a time delay added and then just the light sensor forming part of a resistive bridge. And that is all you're going to get, which is common sense. I mean, it's quite a well-built circuit board. It looks pretty good. Most likely component to fail, particularly if it's on horrible loads like metal halide discharge lighting uh, is really bad for the um, the relay contacts because of the inrush spike to the uh, power factor correct capacitor. Likewise, with some LED loads, you've also got a huge inrush to the power supply uh, electrolytic. But typically, depending on the load, I'd say that the most likely component that I think might fail is the contacts, the relay. I'm not sure. It doesn't have that thing that it's got the thermal fuse next to the body as some of the uh, little time switches have where they use uh, that to detect overheating contacts. Presumably they just used a better quality relay in here and they just allow for the fact the load isn't that high anyway. If you want to drive a higher load, you can use this to drive a contactor which can then switch a much higher uh, amount of light. But there we have it. It's a very simple circuit. It's quite a nice circuit board design. It's single-sided. It looks very old-fashioned, quite frankly. 
The very first of this style of unit had a massive LDR inside, light dependent resistor cadmium sulfide type thing. And uh, it actually passed current through a little heating coil connected pretty much direct across the mains with a bimetallic strip inside. That was how they worked. And uh, during daylight, it passed current through that to actually click the bimetallic strip off. So ultimately, I guess that even in daylight with those old fashioned ones, when you turned them on, they lit initially. But there we go. Uh, that's it. Quite an interesting circuit and well worth taking to bits.